Welcome to the latest edition of Here's What We Know, the podcast of unexpected conversations before I get started. As always, I want to thank my sponsors and encourage you to explore their businesses. Without them, none of this is possible. And nobody understands that whole concept better than Chase Harmers, who I have with me right now. Because your job is to get people paid, right? That's what you started off. You, you were the CEO and founder of Pay Certify, and now you're into wishes, aren't mm -hmm. we all? That's right. Yeah. I mean, you know, just tracing the dream, chasing wishes, you know, that's what we do. <laughs> Can I get a little bit of your story? Because first off, we found out when they, when the publicist said, hey, you want to talk to Chase Harmer? And I'm like, well, let me look him up, right? Let me talk, because because I'm just interested in conversations. And I started sure. reading about your story and I'm like, first of all, he's from Los Gatos, which if you're yeah. listening to this around the country, around the world, that's my backyard. Right. So to find out that you were here. And then when I started hearing about your story, dude, you I was kidding you before we went on the air, but you are a baller in the best sense of the word. You hustle. Well, you know, I I hustle, man. I've been hustling forever and uh just trying to make things happen, you know. That's my story. Yeah. So where did it start out? I mean, because because tell a little bit of your story, because we're going to get into everything else. Well, and we're going to get a lot of other stuff. But we're going to get into astrophysics, by the way. I'm just going to let you know. We're going to go down that road. Uh -huh. uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, I, uh, I grew up. I grew up in Willow Glen. Uh, then I, uh, you know, moved to Campbell, went to high school at Midi. Uh, kind of a barrier kid. I got a track scholarship to Cal Poly. And right before the first quarter ended, I dropped out and started a business when I was 19. Um, and that happened to be in payments back when I was, uh, back when you can read the Mercury News and there was classified section and I uh, answered a, an ad and there was, uh, there was a credit card thing. And back in 1998, credit cards really wasn't a thing back then. It, you know, it started to be a thing, you know, but really not. And so I was interested, uh, went and this guy had a lot, little operation. He had a telemarketers. He sent us on appointments. We'd go and talk to people. And I ended up leading that sales office in a matter of months. And then I saw how much money the guy made. And I uh, quit the next day and tried to start my own business. I asked my mom for $3,000 um, because I thought that's all you needed to start a business. <laughs> and uh, didn't, I did it with two partners that I didn't really know. And uh, that, that failed. And uh, I remember I, I, I had been walking up and down because we didn't know how to market back then. So the marketing consisted of me knocking on doors and trying to get people to sign up on for services. <clears throat> and it was, uh, <clears throat> it was like 100 degrees outside. It was hot. And uh, I remember I worked all day. Nobody was buying anything. And, and I went back to the office. The office was in Fremont at the time. And uh, they were playing inside in the a AC office with uh, playing in, uh, some Nintendo games. And I was just like, dude, forget this. You guys are, I'm done. And um, I tried to, I started out on my own. I had got about like a few thousand bucks more. Somehow I came up with a few thousand bucks. I turned that into a $40 million a year business. And then um, decided at that point that I really needed to start building technology. Stripe had kind of come onto the scene at that time. And Stripe's a big uh, e-commerce platform, but they were really building value uh, to make it super easy to sign up for merchant services. And uh, as a merchant service provider, the traditional sense, I really didn't have any technology to support me and I didn't know how to build it. So um, I kind of just started on that journey, made a lot of mistakes, used a lot of my own capital that I made um, from the first uh, venture uh, that had turned into a, a good amount of money and burned through a lot of that capital, uh, learning how to do things wrong. Um, and... Uh, you know, I was able to escape out of there 11 years later, but pioneering some new and novel concepts inside of uh, the payments business, um, you know, kind of turning into the virtual car credit cards. Virtual credit cards is what you see inside of the Apple wallet now, you know, uh, mm -hmm. people are pretty yeah. familiar utilizing that when you go to the store, you use your phone type of deal. Virtual credit cards back in 2013 didn't exist, uh, you know, really for the public. Uh, consumption. It was really just utilized by major travel companies and banks. And so, um, but I came, became fascinated with the way you can move money and, and then apply it to different business models. And uh, patented, I had to came up with seven patents uh, during 11 years. And, um, you know, I, uh, one of the first patents that I did was the process for what the Apple card is doing today inside of the wallet. So, um, you know, I, I, uh, 
it was a big shit show, to be honest with you. The first uh, 11 years, yeah. my first FinTech was the, the biggest shit show of my life. Tons of learning lessons. I had, uh, you know, 160 employees. Mind you, I grew that $40 million business by myself with an assistant. So managing employees was all something new to me. Managing engineers with no technology background, <laughs> definitely an experience that uh, taught me a lot and uh, allowed me to produce product today um, with wishes that... Um, is a fantastic product, super excited about what we're doing. And I think really will change the game for charitable giving and, uh, but just utilized a lot of what I learned, you know, along my 30 years in payments uh, to make something valuable, I think for the market to consume. So we're going to go down wishes lighted and, and talk about that. But here's, here's my take on you. And you can tell me if I'm wrong. And by the way, it never hurts my sure. feelings when somebody says you're wrong. So, okay. So, so just do yeah. that. Some people are like, oh, well, you know, no, if I'm wrong, just go, you are, you could not be more wrong. I <laughs> think the Lord blessed you with this superpower. When I look back over your story, I see someone who had this amazing ability to not be afraid to fail. Yeah. Right. That, that a lot of people are afraid to fail. It's like Michael Jordan. He could not enjoy winning. He just hated losing that much. Right. Sure. But I think there's certain things like what you do when I look over this story, when you go, hey, I'm just going to I'm going to quit college. I'm going to sell this. I'm going to go work for that. I'm going to borrow three dollars from three thousand from my mother. I'm going to, you know, <laughs> what the underside of that current is. And I might fail. And if I yeah. do, I'll do something else and I'll continue to start over. You know, in That's my mind, huge. I never thought I never thought. You know, I never thought failure was an option, right? So I always thought, I think I'm a, I'm an optimist by by nature. And I think most entrepreneurs um, that pursue something that's crazy to most people, we all believe that we can do it. But I think being a founder, just being connected to the outcome, um, it was more meaningful for me to create a product that mattered, that actually was real, than you know making a fortune or trying to make money. It was all about making something that mattered you know, and that people wanted. And uh, that was really like, I, that was how I drew meaning for myself. You know, actually, I, I, I kind of tied myself to the outcome, which is not necessarily a good thing, because, um, you know, there's, you could totally fail. And, uh, you know, and when you're innovating something like the last 11 years, and you're failing, 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 because when you innovate something, you fail, like, it's, I mean, almost 10 times out of 10, you know, and then you finally, you finally like start cracking the wheel, but it's like it, the failures are harder to overcome, especially, you, you know, if you, if you came in there with any type of ego, yeah, you, you know, you have no ego, I think at the end, because you just, you'd be down, you know, by, by the losses, but you know, it's just part of the deal. So like, it just kind of, you either, you either get killed by, by those failures or, or you, you choose to just keep on going, and you know, um, I don't, I don't see keep on going as a choice. I just feel it as like a, it's an obligation. Well, and that's what that's, but boy, because I think we're seeing the different sides of the same coin. Because you were like, I don't look at failure as an option, and I look at with well, the reality now that you can look back at it. Yeah, it yeah. is. Failure is an option, totally. But <laughs> the ability to give up <clears throat> was not an option. Right. And that's when I say so that when you say failure was not an option, yeah, tying yourself to the product and stuff. What I hear is failure to try on my part was never an option. Mm -hmm. Because when you looked at your buddies playing the video games, or not your buddies, your partners playing the video games, the air conditioned office, that was okay. This has failed. And I am going to jettison this. And, and yeah, every exactly. failure, and you've heard these tropes, you've heard these things, every failure is you're learning, okay, well, now I know this way doesn't work, which is a hell. You, you need to know, well, this doesn't work. So, you know, let's go from there. Right. And your ability to learn, your ability to, okay, I'm going to take this lesson. And most importantly, because, and I hope, I hope anybody listening, especially if, you, if you're an entrepreneur or trying or thinking about it, the odds are something's going to go wrong. Matter of fact, if something didn't go wrong, that would be the weirdest of all computations. It always but goes wrong. It's, it's, it's not giving up when the thing fails. You can give up when yeah. the thing fails. Just don't give up on you. 
you you have to know that I'm still going. I still have this. I still got it. Mm, this idea, you know, the nine string guitar, it failed. It failed. <laughs> but I still think there's a market for what I'm trying to do. Sure. Sure. I think, you know, until you let that fat lady get up on the stage, um, you know, that's it. Like, you're the only person that can say it's over. There's, it's not over until you say it's over. And, um, you know, if, if there's still an ounce of uh, daylight to grasp onto, then I grasp onto that daylight and I try to make the sunshine. How has, and I'm going to ask you an indelicate question because I kind of got the feeling, hopefully you'll answer me. Um, yeah. With the success, how has it changed you, good or bad? How has it changed you that you can see? And maybe you'll say it hasn't changed you at all, but would the people who know you say that? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm one of those guys that I've had, I've had a lot of success, but I've also had a, a lot of failures. And I think that, um, you know, personally, like I've had my own struggles. And so, you know, I think, um, you know, there was a time you know, 2021, where I, I faced a real challenge that I put myself into personally. And, you know, I almost basically lost everything. And then I had to rebuild it all, um, you know, from scratch. So I think, you know, the, the people, you know, it, it, no matter how you feel yourself, in, in no matter, people are capable of anything. You, you know, I could have like said, you know, fuck this and just like, uh -huh. And just went on a crazy path at that point, you know, and said, fuck, like everything, like the last 11 years that I worked for, all these things that I built, like, what was it for? Like, what did I, like, I spent all my money, all my capital, all my, my, my hours of all my time, you know, and missed time with my son and, you know, my family and did all these things. And then all of a sudden it's just gone, you know, it's like, well, you know, when that happens, like you have a choice, right? The choice is um, you either sit down and fucking cry about it. Or you you decide to to do something else to redeem yourself, and I think the value of a human is not what you can do with money, but what you can do without it. Dude, you need to write that down. Have you have you written <laughs> that down? Has that has that has that been anything you ever posted or something? No. I mean, because that right there is brilliant. You, you, it's not what you can do with money; it's what you can do without it. Wow. Yeah. Man, <laughs> there's your Instagram post. You're welcome. You're welcome, Chase. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy I was able to mine that little thing for you because that <laughs> is truly brilliant. And and the fact yeah. that you that's what I that's what I enjoyed. That's what I was talking about from the start, is that your fear, your lack of fear of failure. It's not that you embrace failure. You just, you know, oh. and all the things. To me, that's how it changed you. It changed you that it yeah. gave you such a great idea that did I waste all of this? My son's here. My this is all, you know, everything that's important. You know, it, I, I, I got I had kids late in life, so I got to be as selfish as I wanted to be. As long as I wanted to be. First yeah. thing I thought of in the morning was my my needs. The last thing I thought of at night was my needs. And now, yeah. as I tell my kids, I am anywhere between fifth to eighth on the list. And I'll give you sure. a big secret. The lower on the list I get, the happier I get. No, totally. A hundred percent. And I think, you know, that's what, you know, in, in all things, um, you know, what happened to me and what really kind of like it broke me you know, broke me, put me in a depression. And I was like, really just uh, feeling sorry for myself, you know, because I was yeah. tied to this outcome. I had this idea of what was going to happen, where, where I was going to be and all these things and that all changed, you know, and, um, you know, but, you know, you can pick up the pieces and, and let your son or your family look, you know, say, hey, well, fuck, like, I guess when you break, you just, it's fucking over, you know, or like, do you, do you break, pick up the pieces and, and, um, and show the world like what you're made of, you know? And I think, you know, no matter what, you know, when I started this, when I started this, this last company, like I really started it with like, not, not too much of a dime to my name, you know? And I somehow put together $2 million and, uh, over the last 16 months and we built a fantastic product. And, uh, but, you know, and then I look at the years before and you say, not, that's not a waste. Well, it's hard to, when you're in the moment to go, but well, I learned. Well, it's like, 
fuck that. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> learn. <laughs> well, it's you. You, you, you said it no, exactly it's right. It's true. It's it's true. It's everyone, at the moment. Everyone, and everyone says that. But like, when you're in the journey, when you're in that moment, that is like when it's like, man, this is like, you, you know, you can look. In, but I, what I did was I said, well, you know, like this new this new idea, this new concept that we had for charitable giving, what. I really like, I was like, well, had I not gone through those 11 years of like trying everything and breaking the wheel a million different times to try to innovate those things in that virtual credit card world, like I would have never been able to do what I did in, in the 16 months that we put together. And it, so it wasn't all for a loss. It was like major, major learning lessons. I realized what, like where I'm very, very good and where I'm not so good and, uh, you know, where I could definitely improve. And I think, uh, Part of that was just, you know, I had no, I had no spiritual connection and, you know, not that this is preaching or anything like this, but I, but I definitely, um, felt like, you know, not like religion -y stuff, but like just having that connection with something bigger than you, um, I think really helps too, because a lot of times when you're on that journey, you feel alone, you know? And, uh, and then when the world turns and you are in the verge of losing things or, you know, you can't make a payroll or all these different things, you know, you really feel, you really see like who's with you and who's not with you. And a lot of times it just feels like you're by yourself. You're on an island, you know, and nobody really understands what you're going through. So I think a lot of times like when you have that spiritual connection, it allows you to at least know that there's someone else or something else with you um, to a lot, help you along that journey. So. Hey, I'll, I'll get as spiritual as you want. I, I am a man of faith and, and it helps me. It helps me knowing that, yeah, I'm not alone. It helps me knowing that there's, there's a bigger connection to what we're going. And this is my mother's favorite, favorite saying was always this too shall pass good or bad. This too shall pass. Sure. Right? right. And it helps you get through whatever you're going because, you know, we're, <laughs> we're spiritual beings here for a, for a physical experience. And, and going right. from there, but I I I, uh, I love that, and I, I th that's what I I just find interesting. And now let's talk about let's talk about your next journey. But tell me about mm -hmm. Wish. Tell me about this. Tell me how it what it is, what you hope for it, where are you going? Yeah, well, so you know, after this whole experience and and doing all these things, I, I wanted to make something more meaningful, not just to try to make myself. Uh, wealthy, but uh, try to impact uh, as many people as I possibly could and try to leave a legacy that my son could be proud of, um, you know, whatever happens to me in, in my path, you know, and so really, that's kind of what we're based for. So I started trying to give back, back to charities more often. Um, and you either have one or two things, you have time or you have money, right? So if you have time, like you can go volunteer, you're doing that connection work, you're, you're feeling the good that you're putting back into the world, you see the connection and the, and the impact that you're making directly because you're there on the ground floor. Now, if you're giving financially uh, money um, or resources or whatever, but you're never actually seeing the impact, what exists today in charitable giving is, and what I was experience is when I, whenever I gave charitable donations, whenever I gave uh, even money directly to an individual, you never really knew what happened afterwards. Like, what happened? Like, what what charity do you know of, or have you actually participated in that actually gave you the results back and told you, hey, this is what we did with your money? Zero of them is the answer. Um, so, you know, I wanted to build something that, and, and if you look, ask any donor today, and every, really what kind of started was the grocery stores first. It started to annoy me. Every grocery store is asking me for a dollar. And I was like, hey, man, where's this dollar? Dollar for the kids. Like, what kids? <laughs> like, who, like, who, wh how's it helping? And then you see a commercial for that same grocery store. We gave $60 million to blah, blah. It's like, no, you didn't. Like all the people, all the consumers that actually gave you a dollar were the ones that did that $60 million. And guess who gets the tax credit for it? That grocery store. So I was just like, this is, this is ridiculous. Um, and then also, um, you know, I had spent the last 11 years really kind of pioneering purchases before sales. So if you think about, um, and I'll leave the, use this example because it's it's probably easier to understand. Like if you think about like uh, the, the travel business, like Expedia.com, Booking.com, these types of places, right? When you go okay. book a hotel or an airline ticket, something like this, you're going to make a purchase 
but that air that Expedia is not the airline and they're not the hotel, right? So how do they book that ticket in real time when you make your ticket purchase through them, right? At a discounted rate. Well, what they actually do is they turn that those that that booking reservation on booking.com as an example into a virtual credit card and then they pay the hotel or they pay the airline in real time and secure that that ticket. So every purchase was every sale was a purchase before that, right? So if you think about this, they already had discounted rates. They basically just book that in real time, kind of front the cash, take the and then they arbitrage. There's money on both sides of that transaction for them. But in real time, that's how they do it, right? So now I was like, well, and that's kind of how I became assessed with assessed with like pushing money and pulling money and, and putting in all these different directions. So I rebuilt the whole entire infrastructure for the ability to take donations. I think number one, the biggest, the biggest um, failure of all the crowdfunding platforms that exist today is none of them offer a tax deductible event. So if you go and actually donate towards an individual or cause or crisis on like a GoFundMe or anything like this, there's no tax deduction. Number two, there's no gamification. Not that we need that as donors. We want to feel good, but isn't it be great if like you could support a cat? They take Maui, for example. Maui fires, you had people that needed to stay in a hotel room. They needed people, uh, people families needed groceries. Um, they needed a, a place to stay. So you could actually donate towards uh, an airline category, right? Or a hotel category, get your cash back and rewards and your tax deductible event. We turn that uh, money into a virtual credit card and it's issued directly into that individual cause or crisis right at that time. As the card issuer, um, we're, when those transactions are spent inside of our shopping portal, and our shopping portal consists of pretty much every big box retailer in the United States, so Costco, Sam's Club, Kroger's, Expedia, Booking.com, um, all of the places, right? Push them right into the portal. They make the purchases instantly, and um, or it's pushed to the Apple and Google wallet, and they can go to the store and make the purchase. Charities can make the purchase, and at that time, Donors can always understand what's happening to the money in real time. So just like when you make a credit card purchase at the grocery store and you go home and you check your balance, you can see the transaction you made. Same thing here applies. So you're actually able to see how those wishers in our platform, whether that's a charity cause or crisis, can actually use those dollars and, uh, you know, essentially, um, you know, that they were never misused at, at that time. So it's, it's really donor insight and understanding, um, which is if you ask any donor why they don't donate is like, what goes to admin? What goes to impact? You know, nobody actually knows. And I think that's really the biggest problem that exists in charitable giving is this lack of trust that none of us have anymore, you know? So. You know what I love doing this podcast? I love it when <laughs> I get, when I get taught something, when, when somebody <laughs> tells me something that I didn't know and my brain goes, son of a, Wow. And I had never had any idea about how Expedia works or any of those places works. And and sure. and the, and you're right. I mean, when you give a dollar at the at the grocery store, yeah, they get the sixty million dollar tax credit. And no, right. it's not why people give. But I mean, is it right that they get the tax credit because they took the time to ask you for money? Uh, no, well, you don't even really know half the time where it goes. That's the other thing. Exactly. Like, and then and we've all we've all seen yes. those horror stories of CEOs who make a half million a year, you know, or two million a year. And and you're like, right. wait, hold on. That ain't right. You know, or not even a half million a year. I mean, right. you know, 10 million a year. And and you're yeah. like, hold on. You're a charity making 10 million a year for the CEO. And, and it's wonderful that I love this idea. And, and again, the idea that it took. Chase Harmon in 2022, 23, to go, hey, where, how, why is amazing to me, right? I mean, the, well, the fact that, that you had that little bug in your head and you go, let me start pulling at this string and see where it leads. You know, I, I figure our, my thesis is, in me as a donor, and the reason why I did this as a donor is one of the other thing is you have all your tax donations in one place, right? And then it, all things being created equal, if you give to the Red Cross directly, or if you give to the Red Cross or, through our platform, there's no difference other than you would get rewarded, you have tax deductibility instantaneously, and you can see how Red Cross uses your money. Um, whereas if you give it to them directly, you don't get any of that insight. Um, you know, and uh, as a donor, my, our thesis is really like, 
if people understood what happened to their money, they'd give more and more often. And I think that's really why I built this is to, to really make the world a better place and to help as many people as possible. And I think most donors sit on the sidelines because they really just don't understand. Um, and, you know, it's a shame, but, you know, when you hear these stories of, you know, nonprofits with a parking lot full of Mercedes Benz, you wonder, right, what's going to admin, what's going to impact and why are all these guys getting compensated so much? Yeah, it's a business. I get it. But, you know, it should be focused on the mission, you know, and, and if you have a choice to, to give towards the impact or, or the admin, that should be a choice. It shouldn't be an obligation. Yeah, and I and I think you nailed it. I mean, you know, our uh, our church does a thing where we try to support children in need overseas, but they're very clear about this. What you know, every money you get, this is what happens. This is what we're doing. This is what we're buying. This is what that. And what it does is it leads you to support more and go longer. Yeah, because you know where it's going, right? And if you have an idea yeah. of where it's going, then yeah, and and you know the the old scripture is where your where's your heart, where your treasure, your heart is. Wherever your treasure is, is your heart. You know, and, we actually. Uh, and, we, I was going to say we built a uh, we built our platform on a white label, and so we actually have uh, some mega churches in Washington um, that have private labeled our platform and are rolling it out to um, pastors all over the country. So, um, you know, for for the church specifically, um, for the churches and the different types of religions as well. So that way, um, you know, because you all have your own congregation, your own. Um, community, and you all have your yeah. own things going on. You all have your own missions that you want to support, and um, you know. So we want to probably kind of breathe life into that and allow the community to exist inside of a you know, so everyone can actually participate and understand like how they're helping, you know, as well. So, so cool. All right, I'm I'm gonna take a break because <laughs> we got to pay for this podcast. So we'll be right back yeah. with more for Chase Harmer on Here's What We Know. If you're looking for Western wear, you need to find Winchester Western wear at 1185 South Bascom Avenue in San Jose. You're not going to find the perfect outfit at the mall of the outlets. Come to the place with over 40 years of experience and all the top name brands like Ariat, Justin, Stetson, Tony Lama, and more. When you go to the great country shows at Shoreline, SAP, Club Rodeo, or Clola Shans, you'll be looking your best. From boots to hats to everything in between with a knowledgeable staff that'll make the entire experience a fun one. Find them online at WinchesterWW.com. That's WinchesterWW.com. Or put this in your maps, 1185 South Bascom Avenue in San Jose. Winchester Western Wear. They'll help you find the look you love. So, Chase. So, I, yeah. I, I, I was doing my research on you, right? Because that's what I did. <laughs> yeah. And I went yeah. to your website and your blog. Oh. Your blog <laughs> yeah. is fascinating because some of his posts are literally like a line that's it and then some <laughs> like the astrophysics is yeah. is a is a page and i <laughs> am the biggest astrophysics buff in the world right and you okay. go deep into it you go into are we in a simulation you know and yeah. and, and i mean yeah. it, it just took me so off guard and i found it fascinating I found it absolutely fascinating, <laughs> but it took me just because you had a thing where, you know, your faith and and, and where God leads you and, and stuff like that. I'm like, this is cool. And then that I'm like, dude, me and him are going to be friends. That's why. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, cause we, I mean if you think about it, like, could the simulation could actually be like that God presence. It could very well be that. Like, you know, and maybe we just I mean, it's a rabbit hole. Like we we can go down it, though. <laughs> Oh, well, it, it, it's just, I, that's what I love it when you, and you talk about quantum physics and stuff like that. And I have, I have an 11 and a 13 year old, right? Because mm -hmm. I had kids late. This right here is the face of optimism. That's what this is. And, <laughs> uh, and so my 11 year old was talking to me a couple of days ago and he goes, so what? Actually, it was longer than that. I think we're watching the Ant-Man movie. And he goes, so can you explain quantum physics to me? And mm -hmm. I said, First of all, son, you realize your dad has been a country music DJ his entire life. I don't know why you would think I would know, kind of, you know, but he knows I'm a bit of a geek. And I'm like, yeah. here's the best way of I can explain it to you. That we have laws that govern the, the universe we can see, right? That mm -hmm. gravity and math and, and everything, and, and everything works. And it's that way and this way, and it never varies. But once you mm -hmm. shrink down and get to the quantum, 
all of our laws don't apply and right. we don't know why. Yeah, exactly. You know, that in the big yeah. scheme of things, you don't touch anything. There's quantumly, it's the bonds that keep you, you can, I did, but you don't touch it. I mean, it, it is just, it is brain bending. Yeah. And now it that is. we're finding with the James Webb telescope, because I'm going to geek out yeah. really hard. Right. Yeah. What yeah. we're finding is a lot of the things in our macro universe, when we're finding that sometimes the laws don't apply out there in the big things either. Right. This is black hole, white hole stuff. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Which, which didn't actually exist before, but the, the theory that those two things actually are real means something sucks in and you can pop you out on the other side of a dimension. So if you could actually somehow go through there, and maybe that's what our beings do, right? Maybe what beings are here for. Maybe we're just like wearing skin, you know, but ultimately at the end of the day, like the being is like what is actually going into the universe. There's billions of, I mean, why is the universe so freaking huge, right? How is it so huge? Why? Like, what's the purpose? But if you think about all the people that ever died, ever, right? Like, you got to, like, put all those people somewhere, right? Well, and, and think about, but here's my thing as, as we go down this rabbit hole. Because like I told you, if you give me a little bit of room to geek out, I will geek on you so hard. Um, <laughs> but uh, but it, we, we have no concept because people ask me, you know, what do you think about UFOs and stuff? And I'm like, I want to believe I'm the biggest Star Trek, Star Wars fan. I yeah. love that. I, yeah, I want to believe, but we cannot contemplate the distances right. of the universe. You can't contemplate right. that the moon is a quarter of a million miles from us right that that it that that that, that jupiter is a billion miles and saturn the next planet is a billion miles from jupiter and oh by the way the uh, the 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 the, uh, the spacecraft that i never can remember the name of that went and took the pictures of pluto it, it took what eight to well, eleven years i can't remember to get to pluto going at thirty two thousand miles an hour and it will leave the solar system in another 240 years. That's how big a solar system is before it gets out of the right. Earth cloud. And and right. and when we hear light years, something's only two two light years away. Three. Do you know a light year is like a trillion miles, 186,000 yeah. miles a second for a year. But, but that's what that's what kind of in, interests me in the white hole black hole theory is that like it's almost like a Star Trek. Right, where you can enter if they they say that the black hole could tear you apart and all these things, right? But, um, but they're, I mean, we don't actually know that for sure, for certain, yeah, right? Yeah. So there could be a world. And we have in no which way of knowing it because it would be not observable for us. Billion, yeah, you could pop out a billion light years later in a whole other galaxy, like in a, you know a few minutes. You know, it's possible. Yeah. It's crazy. Like I said, I love I love the fact some of the conundrums with the James Webb Telescope is that they found a uh, yeah. they found a uh, uh, a, 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 a a galaxy that was four. Well, they originally thought it was twenty point three billion years old. Now the uh -huh. problem with that, and then then they readjusted their math and said, okay, it's only fourteen point six billion. The problem with that is, is up until this year, we have always assumed the galaxy, I mean the the universe was 13.8 billion years old. Ruh -roh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying. It's like, there's so many theories. It's like, I mean, it's just like, I mean, a lot of, a lot of what we know, it doesn't make sense to me totally, you know? And I think well, a lot of what we're undercovering, you know, it kind of gives like a little bit of like, um, thought like to fuck, like, it may be like maybe there maybe like what i'm saying could potentially be true maybe not all of it but like there could be like some sort of like it it could actually be a thing you know like that's actually my real mind on that page <laughs> like that's how i'm thinking about it yeah and that's what i said when i read it i'm like yeah because because it you you make a good argument for it and again you'll find it at chase harmer you know look up his website we'll have it in the show notes uh and 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 you'll see that yeah, it's a it's a really well thought out idea with the simulation and stuff. And okay, I'm not gonna let you off the hook. What do you think about the UFOs? What do you think about what do you think about vision? You think you think we've well, been yeah, visited? You think we've been here? You think it's what? Well, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, the whole UFO thing, I'm not exactly sure about. Um, what I do kind of believe, you know, if you think about it, like 
if this was a simulation, actually, right, then somebody could very well be behind some sort of supercomputer making these decisions. A supercomputer like, maybe not a computer like the way that we know it, but, um, you know, almost like in the Hunger Games, right? Where like all of a sudden, like you're in this, you look like you're in this forest, but you're really not in a forest. You're like, this is, it's like an illusion of a forest, right? So they can create these obstacles and roadblocks all the time. But, you know, why, why would this simulation exist? Like for what purpose, right? And I think, you know, number one, to control us. Right. Um, I think, you know, we're, we believe that we're in this like 3D society and we talked about this, but, you know, this 3D is could be very, uh, very well an illusion. And what we are uncovering in the universe is that there's lots of other strings that make up like 10 to 11 dimensions. Right. So which allow kind of break us down to molecules. So when we're looking at somebody, it's really not that's not what they are. It's just we're, we're a bunch of different strings that are all tied together that look like uh, that look like humans. You know, but are we actually humans? Like, who knows what we look like to other people? You know, maybe this is just what our eyes see. You know, who knows? Like, see. I mean, it is really <laughs> a rabbit hole. But uh, I mean, it, it kind of, you. you know, <laughs> that's true. I mean, I, it, you can go down into the hole, and yeah, you just keep going. No, I, I just get, get were you were you always fascinated by science? Was it something I mean, I get I know you're in the technology world, but that doesn't mean everybody's always fascinated by by any kind of genre. Was it anything that was always fascinating to you? Yeah, history. Like I was always really interested in history. Um, you know, I I I loved like, you know, just uh the whole civil war, like uh not what happened, but like, you know, just um, you know, visiting those, uh, like the houses, like how it was just like all in real time and, um, the history of our country, like how the Titans of industry, you know, kind of all like they had these really interesting stories that built like iconic companies, but then they all came together to like help our, help our government and our, our America, like, uh, be, uh, like more of a superpower and really in the time of need. And I think just the American story, like, you know, even going back to like James, you know, Boone, like when he was going through, you know, the wilderness and, and covering these territories and, um, you know, it, it's, uh, we're just, I think the American, like, we're all like pioneers at heart. Like we all like want to blaze our own trail, I think. And, you know, some people, um, have the balls to do it. And, um, you know, other people are, are part of, the overall strategy and and that's supposed that's the way it's supposed to be they're supposed to be pioneers and they're supposed to be people that are supporting pioneers and i think that's the really way that that god made us is like we're not all supposed to be the same they're supposed to be crazy idiots that follow dreams that maybe are possible um but are not afraid to do it and that those dreams maybe turn out to be real and uh or maybe they don't but you know i think it's only in trying that we really find out like who we're made of and what we're supposed to be doing in this world and what our purpose is about, you know? So, Dude, yeah, I've got, yeah. you like, I've got some, I've got some podcasts, you know, that I've done with some historians that you'll love. So if you get a chance, yeah. you know, let me, here's me plugging, plugging you in real time to listen to some of my, there's some that I think you'd love. Uh, Sean Mirsky, yeah. uh, Luke Nichter, who I just did. Uh, those are, those are fun historians. And we just, as you can tell, I went down rabbit holes with them too. Right. Just as, <laughs> because it's what I do. I told you before we started, I don't have questions. I just, I just yeah. like talking because I find people interest, especially smart people who have a different experience than me. And, and it's like, yeah. and that's why I told you early on, please don't be afraid to tell me I'm wrong. It doesn't hurt my feelings. No. And, 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 yeah. and I always tell everybody in any kind of debate I ever get in, the secret is, is I, I'm secretly pulling for you. Because if you <laughs> prove me wrong, it means I've learned something. If you yeah. don't prove me wrong, I really haven't learned something, right? But but if you if you can say, hey, have you thought of it this way? And I go, no. Now that's a better <laughs> day. That is that is yeah. a much better day. And sure. I find yeah. history and and the fact that even today. And I love your message that you are the epitome of America is still is the land of hopes and dreams. If you are willing to work hard, there yeah. are people who are willing to run through walls for you. You know, one of the charities mm -hmm. I work with is Boys and Girls Club of Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. and, and I've had this conversation with some of the children there. It's like I grew up desperately poor. 
And I mean, mm-hmm. I lived in a house with cardboard walls. You could scratch the paint off and see Charmin. I'm not lying. Right. <laughs> so I, 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 I've been there. And what I found is by showing I was willing to work and try, there were a whole bunch of people who would say, come here, come here, let's do this. Let's do this. And, and it's yeah. so easy to sit back and, and fall in and say, what are you going to give me? Instead of, you know, in my industry, people always want to know, how do you make it? And I'm like, you get your foot in the door and every time they let you work, you work. And if they call you mm-hmm. up and say, I need you Tuesday morning at 2.15 a.m. till 3.30. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, mm-hmm. I, I will be there. You know, right. and and I love your story because I think I think that's the quintessential American story is that you sit back and said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get a great idea, but mainly I'm going to work harder than you work. And I'm not going to be afraid mm-hmm. of working harder than you work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and not afraid of failing. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of people, you know, I could have um, the very first time that I started building technology, I, I had no idea what I was doing and I made a t- million trillion mistakes that cost lots of money and, and lots of time and, um, lots of, uh, you know, bad, bad, uh, you know, like you, you turn up an Albuquerque type of things like, Oh my God, like you have to start over from scratch type of things. And, but I think the only way to do it is, is just to do it. Um, there is no roadmap. Um, you know, you can read a million books, but the books don't help you when you're in the journey, you know, in the journey, um, your journey is going to be different than everyone else's. And I think, um, the only way to actually pioneer your own trail is to, is to make it, is to just go on the trail and, um, uh, take your first steps and, uh, it's never going to be easy and, uh, it's going to suck most of the time. Uh, <laughs> have but, you seen the workforce you know, you, change? Um, was that, have, have you seen the, have you seen the workforce change? And I say that because I have a friend of mine who's in the high tech industry and he decided to retire, get out of management because he couldn't find people who wanted to work as hard as he wanted to work. Right. And, and back mm-hmm. when he was growing up, you know, you could have fired those people, but nowadays you can't. So I, I'm yeah. not asking you to handle a foot, a political football. I'm just asking in your experience, have you seen a change, good or bad? And and maybe yours is a lot better. That there's a lot of people out there who are, man, just give me the opportunity. I'm after it. Yeah, I think um, I did everything different than I did it the first time. You know, I think we really kind of went through a hiring frenzy, and we were just hiring. You know, do you breathe? Cool, let's get in here because we need help, right? <laughs> and um, that actually isn't the best way to do it. Really? Um, you know, <laughs> Hold on, I'm writing that down. <laughs> yeah i mean and uh you know we had we had lots of problems um but i think now you know the way that i did it is uh in the way that i started this company is i really um because we had contracts we had employees but we had uh i had a partnership that i made with um a development company and we kind of partnered to provide, they provided all the engineers, they provided all the things, but we had an end game in mind that was the same, right? So instead of actually me paying them for a job and the job never ends because that's when the payment ends, right? So essentially when we're all trying to go towards the same end goal, uh, I find that we all are, um, we all have the final destiny in in mind. And I think that really helped us uh, pave this way. And and we're all, all of our remote workforce is remote. The only thing that we have internally um, here in, in Reno is uh, the customer success department, which essentially is uh, the human touch element of what we're doing, you know, so, you know, the journey of the, all the user flows that we have and the personas that we have inside of our platform. Um, we have, you know, managers and agents and uh, support representatives uh, that help. And I think that's really, that's all helpful to have in-house. Um, all the other kind of departments, um, I feel like you can manage it remotely if you have the right infrastructure, you know, uh, so. Really? So that, so that industry yeah. can, can, and again, we, we do our stuff remote. I, there was a, 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 rem- a report that came out in, uh, I think, Discovery Magazine uh, last mm-hmm. week uh, that said that the scientific breakthroughs happen more in in-person research yeah. than remote research, right. you know, mm-hmm. and, and but, they, but they said this may just work in this collab because this truly needs to be a, such a collaboration issue that this, this needs to be, you're sitting around having coffee and going, 
Yeah, let's talk about that string theory and the uh, and the white hole black hole thing, right? <laughs> yeah. And 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 yeah. to have that and to have that ability to pause and wait that maybe sometimes is lost in in this scenario because you're in Reno and I'm in San Jose, right? Uh, th- that where you and I having this conversation, which I love, but I look forward to when you come to town and we add coffee yeah. or, or a glass of wine to it because it'll be a completely different experience. No, totally. No, and I, I agree. I think anytime that you have a big uh, team or even uh, teams are usually siloed in different departments and, you know, they don't always talk to each other. So I feel like having those in-person uh, meetings is is very, very helpful, uh, but you just have to have a, like an agenda, right? You can't just like, let's all get together and then let's just talk about the string to theory. You know, it's like you have to get together um, in in have like an agenda so that you can cover all the things. And I think the string theories come up, you know, when you're, when you're actually having those debates and those uh, agendas that are meaningful, right? Um, to talk about things that uh, might be on the horizon. But if you don't have an agenda and something that you're sticking to, it's kind of hard to um, find it meaningful, I think, um, it, especially in the work environment, not me and you having a conversation. I feel like that would be cool. But, um, you know, in, in the work environment would be, uh, you need to kind of check some boxes and make sure that you're making progress. But it also brings up a lot of other topics that potentially aren't like, subjects of discussion, but they become up because of things that, you know, when you have everybody there and everybody's in that environment, those are the things that uh, I think are the things that are missing when you're on a Zoom meeting or something, you know? So, You see, I just pester you today. I mean, because I'll just sit here and just keep talking because I just, I enjoy the, finding out the way you think about things and, and go from there. We'll, we'll have to do this again. And when, and when you come to town, seriously. Yeah. I want no. I want to I want to look you in the eye and go, hey, okay, now what do you think about this? Come on now. Now let's talk <laughs> about this. What 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 about this uh, planetary thing? Did you see they they found a sun. They found a sun that as far as we can tell is at least a billion times bigger than our sun. And we have no <laughs> way of really We have no way of understanding what a billion times anything is when it comes to a measurement of size. We have no idea. They think it could be as big as 10 billion, which would make it bigger than our solar system. Talk about getting a suntan, right? (laughs) (laughs) and see i mean we will go down every rabbit hole we never got around we need to talk comic books we need to talk (laughs) movies we need we need to talk about all of this but i'm so glad because you taught me about again i i love these one where i walk away and i feel smarter especially how how paid the 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 paid what is the term pay point pay direct pay virtual the virtual credit card Oh, virtual For credit what we were cards, talking yeah. about the virtual credit card. I, I yeah. love it. I never, I never knew how that worked. And the whole idea yeah. behind Wish is brilliant, right? I mean, right. I just, I, I'm leaving here better than you found me. Oh well, thank you. Me too. This has been awesome. <laughs> no, and I'll listen, you know, I'll listen to you on the radio. Yeah. <laughs> hey, KRTY.com still Monday through Friday, 5 30 to 9. Oh, Julie and I are still doing it for all you uh, local Bay Area, and wh- and wherever you are. Wherever you are. I've got uh, friends of mine. I've got people I've heard from Australia and where are we? Where are we at? Germany and Russia. Yeah. Don't ask me why, yeah. but you can find out all the numbers, right? And uh, so if you ever guys want to figure out what time it is, KRTY.com, 5 30 to 9. Chase Harmer, we've got awesome. all the info in the show notes. Dude, you're the best. Thank you, man. I appreciate your time. It's been awesome.